Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities. Welcome again to an episode of the Smart City Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Andrew Lehrer practice leader of ESD. He's a specialist in high-performance building design. Uh, welcome, Andrew. How are you today? Great, Jim. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Excited to talk to you today. Hey, well, we're, we're thrilled to have you. Um, let's jump right in. Can you um, give us, um, for our audience, a little bit of background about yourself and about ESD? Yeah, absolutely. I'll start with uh, with ESD. Um, we're entering our 55th year in business. Our headquarters is here in Chicago, and we're a consulting engineering firm uh, that's really heavily invested in, in building sciences. So um, we our core service practices um, MEP services, but we also offer uh, structural engineering consulting services, um, technology design, um, acoustics, and um, energy and eco services and so essentially anything that's involved in the design of a of a of a building across many different um markets um other than the architecture we're we're here to help and we've been in business for like i said since 1967 i've been with esd um entering my 21st year um so i started right out of school um and i've been in the commercial market sector for the last um during that entire time you know that that that's fascinating. I mean, you bring up just uh, as an example acoustics. You know, there's a tremendous number of human factors that go into building design, mm -hmm. and uh, very often it's typically just um, you know HVAC and lighting and security that uh, come to mind first. But there's an awful lot of other impacts that um, will impact worker productivity and simply the um, you know health and wellness issues of, of the building. So that's a, that's a great broad perspective. Yeah, I mean, we really view what we do as core to the user experience. Um, so once a user has um, is occupying their space, um, how they experience it, their success in, ex in experiencing that space, um, how long they stay there, how um, successful the overall asset is over time, what ESD designs and the systems that we implement, the solutions that we implement into those assets are really pay, play a critical role in determining that success. I'm sure before we leave this topic, uh, I, I, I'd just like to ask you, I'm sure your or my, my intuition is that your efforts begin with a robust assessment of the user needs of the client. Absolutely. Um, what we really pride ourselves on is that um, integrated approach that we have with our clients, be it architects, be it uh, developers, landlords, asset managers, or owners. Um, we really immerse ourselves in the success case, the success metrics and outcome requirements for each of our projects. Um, we don't apply one size fits all application or, or solutions to each one of our projects. It's really a, a, a bespoke case by case basis. And um, understanding the overall goals of a project, how our systems fit into those goals, and really how the user is meant to experience the space is very, very critical to how um, how successful we are in performing our services and why our clients keep, retur keep returning to us. That's great. So can you outline for us, you know, the, the current situation about building design in, in, in particular, well I, was, well, I would say gen generally in terms of sustainability, resilience, the impact of um, some ESG requirements that that are coming, um, and then and then more particularly about building electrification. And I know there's a lot there, so please go through you know slowly all you know any any and all bullets that you might have on that on that topic. 
Yeah, that's that's what we call a loaded question. So I'll uh, I'll <laughs> I'll try to go through them one by one here. But yeah, I'll back up to one of the things you said, which is really about the the SEC uh, direction that that uh, um, was published in March of this year. Um, you know what that's required that that was really a, a heavy catalyst in a lot of the movement that we've seen um, towards sustainability, towards electrification specifically. And so I, in my 20 year career, um, our, our industry, I specifically as a mechanical engineer on the HVAC side, it was a pretty um, slow developing industry for many, many years. Um, lead and the move towards sustainability really changed that starting about 20 years ago. I really consider um, the ASHRAE Energy Standard 90.1 1999 version to, to really have kicked that off. And we've seen a very rapid movement toward sustainability past um, just simple lead certification um, toward uh, heavy ESG centric electrification goals here in the last couple of years because of this SEC requirement, which is mandating um, in fairly ambiguous terms, still open to public comment, um, that any publicly traded company has specific reporting requirements that are going to be phased in over the next five years for scope one and two and possibly scope three um, um, emissions um, as part of their operations, as part of um, investor transparency. Um, and that's really been a critical um, a critical catalyst, as I said, in both leasing activity and development of new assets. So um, Fortune 500 uh, companies that are looking for new space because of this requirement um, being one of the, uh, the key drivers, they're really looking for assets that have this built in, that have this data available or that are um, aligning with their specific goals because they now have to report this over the next few years, it's become a critical, very critical part of their, their own operations. It's also very, very important to their, their employees. Um, as we know, the, the uh, job market's been incredibly competitive for the past uh, couple of years. Um, and part of retaining and attracting that very top level talent is having, it's not just talking the talk, but having these specific transparent published uh, operational carbon um, and sustainability goals um, as part of your um, operations that employees can look to to understand this is what my company stands for, this is where I'm working, and this is important to me. Okay, so you, you mentioned a few regulations and guidances and codes. Um, do you want to uh, perhaps expand on those a little bit? Some of the AIA agreements, some of the electrification codes in, in cities, and perhaps, uh, well, you touched on the SEC um, climate disclosures, but let, let's look at the AIA and some of the city and public agency codes. Right, so there are uh, 2030 and 2050 um, uh, agreements that uh, several uh, large corporations and, and members of our industry have also signed on to commitments, I should say, um, to get to either net zero or significantly reduce their um, operational carbon by those specific dates. 2030 is uh, right around the corner. A lot of leases, most leases that are being signed today are going to um, extend past that requirement or past that specific date. So that's a really important um, item to understand is companies that have made these commitments, most of them are public and have signed on to these commitments. Those dates are rapidly approaching and these actions that are required to comply with those commitments, they're not something, they're not a switch that can be flipped. They're um, very heavily dependent on logistics and development and things that take years and decades to, to implement. Um, and so we've really seen a significant drive to um, engage with that, those specific agreements um, here over the last four or five years. The other thing you mentioned is on the code side. So on building code sides, what we're seeing is in coastal markets, uh, a few examples being Berkeley, San Francisco, Boston, Cambridge, um, New York now has uh, a couple of local ordinances um, uh, that have mandated in all, for all intents and purposes building electrification. So we're seeing these, um, these building codes in our coastal markets uh, requiring that this be implemented, greenhouse either banning natural gas use like they do in San Francisco or effectively banning it via um, requiring emissions reductions and reporting such as New York is doing um, over the next um, five to 
you're by 2050 from starting within five years, um, those building codes are starting to make their way in toward Midwestern markets. They're cascading down to other markets because the folks that are leasing space in that markets in those markets, they set the table um, as they're they develop their standards based on double A and A assets in the coastal markets. Those requirements then drive themselves into markets that are that are um, that are outside of the coastal areas. So we're really starting to see that impact become very very clear in leasing activity. So, so Andrew, in our in our conversation before we started uh, our podcast today, I know that you had um, and ESD has an opinion that uh, a key a key component of this entire process is electrification. Can you talk just uh, you know about that generally, and then and then perhaps a little bit about net zero operational carbon? So those really go hand; those two items go hand in hand. Um, and so net zero operational carbon uh, essentially is no on-site use or burning of fossil fuels um, at a specific asset or within a tenant space, um, and electrification uh, is really pushing toward that. We have an opportunity as the grid becomes more and more renewable here over the coming decades. Um, just to give you an example, um, the state of Illinois, Illinois' grid is is fairly, um, is, is a very low carbon emitter uh, relatively. That's heavily driven by nuclear to be fair, but um, it is about two thirds non-carbon based. And Illinois being the third largest energy exporter, we have a, you know, we play a leading role in energy um, production um, uh, for the grid here. And we have a unique opportunity because of the fact that our, our grid is really only one third carbon based. So driving that more renewable gives then downstream assets the capability of operating without any operational carbon. And what I mean by that is if you're going 100% electric, you're not burning natural gas on site. Um, if that electric then is produced renewably at the grid level, then you don't have any on-site um, operational carbon. Uh, you can accomplish that today either by utilizing um, uh, renewable offsets, so purchasing green energy, um, but in, in reality, um, we're not going to be at a spot where you can have 100% non-operational carbon until the grid is fully renewable or you're able to produce that energy renewably on site. But that's the way the grid is heading. So standardizing around electrified assets using several different strategies revolving um, around the use of electricity, minimizing the use of natural gas on site and, and really developing strategies that if that's not feasible, either from a space standpoint or from a cost standpoint, that you're able to transition to that easily in the future is, is a real key part of how we're planning our projects today. Uh, well, that's that's great. That's great in insights. Uh, let's go back to, to ESG. You know, a portion of ESG is about is about equity. And you know we're um, we have quite a few energy challenges coming down the, the pike. Uh, not not only green energy and and that that initiative, but the issues of uh, reliability and cost. And to me, in many ways, it's a three-legged stool that, well, we don't want um, uh, you know, certain uh, socioeconomic communities to be disadvantaged any more than they already are. Um, nor do we want um, energy costs to uh, to rise uh, in a in a substantial geometric or exponential way. Can you talk about equity and greenhouse gas emissions and that ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, there's a couple things to touch on. Um, the first being just the the cost of power, so cost of energy. Um, and if we can, through intelligent investment, through through renewable energy, renewable energy is really going to allow, um, at a grid basis, energy costs to substantially stabilize and be reduced over the long term. Um, you even want to go so far as the the really um, exciting news we saw this week about the cold fusion um, ignition breakthrough. That technology still, I mean, it, it's been 20 years away for 50 years, right? Um, but it's 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 coming at some point, and uh, we have the opportunity um, in the in the several decades here, meantime, until that technology is 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 uh, mature, uh, to increase the renewable um, portion of our grid. What that does in the long term is it does reduce energy costs, and it substantially increases the resiliency. 
um, of the grid utilizing these renewable technologies, um, both solar, wind, and a key component of that being um, batteries. So as the use of batteries um, increases, the cost of batteries um, lithium ion battery specifically has dropped by almost an order of magnitude over the last 50 to 15 to 20 years. Um, the rapid and expansive deployment of battery technologies, be it in EVs or um, on site, will increase the, the re resiliency of our grid and will improve outcomes for, for people across um, across socioeconomic um, backgrounds and geographies. And it's really important to understand that um, a lot of the um, power generation that does occur right now occurs in sites where, or in areas that are socioeconomically um, disadvantaged um, that have that end up having to deal with emissions and um, the, the knock-on effects of having those plants um, uh, in their in their neighborhoods and in in their geographic areas, renewable plants, while they do have their own challenges, um, without having the emissions, you don't have the air quality and the other long term um, health penalties that those communities have to pay. So the reduced cost of energy in and in and of itself is a great equalizer, but the limited impact of the plants is also in and of itself a great equalizer that um, really contributes heavily to the to the equity portion of ESG. Um, you know, my, my last question in this area, it really revolves around there's there's so many uh, moving parts, let's call it, in in the electrical generation and distribution system. And there's we're at plus we're transitioning from a master slave type network to a peer to peer uh, arbitrage network, um, trading electrons with each other. Uh, it's very difficult to actually measure the um, all those different components and contrast or do do good solid cost accounting. I know that um, you know, previous to, to our um, getting on this podcast today, you talked about transparency and how that's a key driver. Um, what does transparency bring to this this effort? There's a lot of uh, advantages to transparency that um, that are provided through use of technologies and in both um, intelligent buildings um, and and the um, the sort of knockoff industries that are um, associated with that. And just to give a couple of examples, uh, it really allows users um, to understand how they're experiencing their space and also their impact on how the impact that they have on the space as they experience it. Um, just as an example, intelligent building technology, what it does is it allows us to create really more seamless experiences for um, the occupants of our assets. Um, it allows them to have um, insight into the um, systems and energy that they use. They can better understand because things are metered and displayed via dashboards or through um, an app on their phone. Um, they can understand what their company specifically is doing, the portion of the energy that's being utilized um, by them as a tenant or by them as a as an asset owner, um, and utilizing um, specific actions. Uh, a user may have, without insight into their own specific impact, may have just left lights on, not adjusted temperatures, mm -hmm. not uh, adjusted their behavior in any way. But what we have seen is the ability to measure these things in an intelligent manner and to integrate them into the user experience. So that, as an example, um, using a conference space, um, ending a meeting 30 minutes early, releasing that conference space and allowing somebody else to use it, having the lights turn off, having the um, the uh, HVAC system go into a setback mode, all of that can be measured um, and uh, and tracked and users can have that understanding that, you know, what I do really matters. It's more treating your office or treating your workplace like your home. You wouldn't just leave the lights on or leave your refrigerator door op open into your home because, you know, you're more responsible for the, the energy bill. That's really been the, you know, the key driver. But now new folks in the workplace really have more of an a need to, uh, from a sustainability and impact standpoint, understand that their consequences, their actions have those consequences, not just from a monetary standpoint, but from an environmental standpoint. And intelligent buildings, sensors, and systems that are integrated across 
uh, multiple flat platforms give users the opportunity to really understand the impact that they're having. Yeah, and, and I would argue that it's um, even more comprehensive than that. It's not just the user interface, but uh, you know, Moore's law continues to affect the cost of sensors and the prices continue to drop. So now you can monitor things like the bearing temperature on a pump or a blower. And if there's excessive current draw, you guess what? You know your bearing needs to be replaced. Um, yeah, one of the one of the really um, impactful things that we do is monitoring based commissioning. And so that we, after we design um, and initially commission a project, we enter into an agreement where we're monitoring these sites and understanding if something is performing outside of understood spec or if there is an alarm that hasn't been um, zeroed these things can have big impacts over significant over longer periods of time if we all know how operating a building is it's difficult your building engineers are dealing with one fire after the next hopefully not an actual fire but one crisis after another um, they have to react quickly so oftentimes they override things they make quick adjustments and then you know they're all short staffed and they're not able to to set things back or to make the the necessary corrections we're able to monitor those items to make sure that that doesn't stand for a week two months and have a significant energy or operational impact um, those types of technologies are incredibly beneficial to to all both users and um, operators yeah and I, I think that's where transparency comes in where where you do have a dashboard that might show you the most financially and 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 uh the, the largest financial and the largest environmental impacts for each particular situation so that you can task your whatever resources you do have to address whatever is of the most importance to you at that point in time yeah, when you walk into our office, we have a dashboard right in the reception area that um, changes back and forth between two different display types, one being an energy consumption that shows all of the meters directly serving our space and the energy use over time, um, the other being an air quality um, monitoring uh, uh, interface that shows all of our conference and common spaces um, and measures air quality through several different metrics so that the folks in our space can understand that we're not only tracking that but um, you know, making sure that if any of those uh, those go into an alarm or have an issue that we're correcting it um, very quickly um, and I think that's really important to to people that that experience our workspace, not just uh, our employees but also our visitors and our customers that they understand that we're we're implementing these solutions in our own workspace. We value them as well, and we're not just, um, you know, talking uh, talking the talk, if you will. That's fa that's fascinating. Uh, you know, you, both you and I, uh, and many of our listeners are, you know, engineers who are uh, steeped in in a lot of this, and have been hearing it for uh, probably decades. But in many cases, this hasn't been implemented. I mean, I, I was a bit astounded um, last week where I read a statistic where there's 500 million radiators in Europe that do not have thermos, thermostatic controls, for example. So um, what really is holding back the, you know, the deployment, the design and the deployment of these, of these technologies that many of us take well, for granted that they exist and they're regularly being put out into the market. So let's talk about complications, obstacles, impediments, and um, which would you know, please outline those for us. Yeah, sure. So um, a couple of things that are that just pose challenges is is really sort of the kind of standard old villains of cost and um, in logistics, right? Replacing. Um, something that's currently working, although it may not be well, working well or working efficiently, um, it's costly. The logistics of doing it in an active space are, are, are difficult to understand um, and implement. And so those those are challenges. But, you know, on the other side of that, um, it's also a, a big opportunity. So kind of coming back to the electrification side, what we look at is how does this um, how is this implemented both in new construction and then retrofitting existing buildings, um, which is a huge opportunity. We have a lot specifically here in Chicago, a lot of um, uh, of inventory of building of asset inventory that was built um, 50 to 60 years ago in the 60s, 70s and 80s that most of their systems are now aging out. The technology that was utilized to 
uh, to construct those buildings from an envelope and, and energy and conditioning standpoint are, is, is beyond obsolete. So we have some um, uh, some opportunities now to start changing those out. And we're looking at a, a couple of different things. Um, one of them being use of low global warming potential refrigerants. So we have a lot of plants here in Chicago, uh, cooling plants that have chillers that are just aged out need to be replaced. Um, we also have a unique opportunity. We have local incentives from our um, from our energy companies that um, incentivize replacement of those machines with more energy efficient uh, machines because it obviously takes load off their grid and improves the, their customers um, experience as well. And so part of that is, do we use a standard industry refrigerant, which is a from a um, an environmental standpoint, better than the refrigerant that we're replacing from 50 years ago, certainly. But we have this new generation of refrigerants that is, you know, one one thousandth, the one two thousandths, the um, global warming potential of those industry standard refrigerants. And there is some additional costs to those, but it's incremental when you look at the overall cost of the project and with the incentives, it can be a win-win um, situation for both the um, the, the landlord and the community. Just as an example, we replaced um, some machines in um, an asset across the street from our building. Um, we've been doing that over the last couple of years. And just by using that glo lower, lower global warming potential refrigerant was the equivalent of taking uh, 4,000 cars off the road for one year, which is um, one car for half the population of their building. That's a significant impact for the the marginal amount of additional costs that they had to spend and they get to enjoy that um, the benefits of that over the 40-year lifespan of that machine and so there are things that you can do that have fairly low impact um, and what i'd call low-hanging fruit um, but then on the other side of that there's heat pump technology which allows you to go full electric um, that technology although it's rapidly developing there is a cost and space impact for that and just to give you an example, um, on the heating side, um, if you have a boiler that outputs um, a, a certain amount of heat, you can generally get that through a, a normal three foot door. Um, the same amount of heat from an air source heat pump, um, which would be fully electric, you're looking at something that's 25 feet long by 10 feet wide. It's much bigger. And so although that that uh, technology's come quite a long way in the last 10 years, it's still not from a footprint and cost standpoint on par with natural gas um, fired heating technology. And that's a significant challenge. It's not a plug and play. Yeah, I, I, I was still in, in, in that realm of uh, impediments and obstacles. Um, electrification um, may increase the load on the on the distribution grid. Is that, uh, how often is that an issue? It's, it's an issue, um, well, so, uh, from a grid standpoint, we're still understanding the overall impact. We we have some folks that are working with our local utility to understand the long-term impact. Our local utility is confident that they're able to handle the additional um, grid demand over the next 20 years by both um, buildings becoming electrified, and there's a specific reason for that that I'll talk about here, but also just the added load of, of EVs, and um, which is, you know, fairly significant. But, you know, in the city of Chicago, we actually have um, downtown a lot of assets that are already 100% electric. Um, they use electric resistance heating, which is really just a one-for-one a -one swap. So for every watt you put in, you get basically a watt out. Um, and so the cost to operate that, while it is 100% electric, is is relatively high and not on par with with natural gas, which is generally cheaper per unit energy. To use these heat pumps, which can get you um, between one and a half and three watts out per every watt you put in, that's where you're paying that footprint and cost penalty. That's where it becomes um, becomes difficult. But because the city of Chicago is already heavily set up for all electric resistance heating. Our grid is already remarkably resilient um, and in a good spot. Other jurisdictions, other locations, that's more of a challenge where they're more um, accustomed to gas fired or oil or other types of heating technologies. So, okay, you, you've given us some of the complications. Um, you know, what do you see, how, how do we surmount some of these um, situations? Well, I think the, the good news here is where we do have some of these challenges, um, there's a couple of, of things we can do. On the, the asset side, um, we can, we've developed um, our team here at ESD, what we like to call bridge solutions. Um, so 
while we have these footprints and logistical challenges with using air source heat pumps, we've developed solutions where we can deploy them for a part of the building's load. So above a specific outdoor air temperature, we can handle all of the heating from the electric side. And then below that temperature, we can either use gas fired or electric resistance boilers. And that's a relatively small number of hours per year in an office asset. It might be 100 or 200 operating hours a year. So for the vast majority of your um, of your operating hours, you're 100% electric, and that's going to significantly reduce, reduce your on-site operational carbon. That will also allow you in 15 years when the technology, 15, 20 years, when the heat pump technology has progressed further, the footprints have shrunk, and those that original equipment is starting to age out, you're able to swap that and um, do that relatively easy, easily um, compared to having to decommission gas-fired assets that are serving the entire entire building, um, it becomes more of a logistical challenge there. And so developing and deploying bridge solutions on the asset side is, in, is incredibly important. On the, the grid side, well, this is not my area of expertise, full, di full disclosure. Um, what, we, uh, what we're really um, focused on is working in concert with our local utilities to help them plan for these types of uh, this type of a transition. So where you know, they all have um, specific uh, assumptions that they make and, and standards that they use for residential buildings, for commercial buildings, for institutional buildings, um, when they're planning for their deployment, we're working with them to help them adjust those plans to say, hey, you know, in the future, as these electric options, uh, this electrification option keeps proliferating, you're going to need to plan for this much load and this much load and this much load for these different types of assets based on or versus what you're currently planning. And that allows them to, 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 to intelligently plan for those changes over the next one to two decades, which is really how long it's going to take to get this fully implemented um, and, and, and make, those, uh, make those changes in an intelligent manner. Let me let me before before we move on to uh, the impact of electric vehicle charging, which is um, a significant uh, you know issue. Uh, let me ask about. I come from the the lighting world, and in the you know in the projects you're involved in, um, what is the power requirements for um, of lighting compared to say HVAC or some of the other applications, the elevators, the escalators, or other other applications. Yeah, lighting is actually a great success story. Um, so when I started my career 20 years ago, um, I'm talking about for a, you know, like a typical commercial project, lighting was generally in the one and a half to two watts per square foot range, and that's been cut by more than half. So code allows you to use just over seven tenths of a watt um, per square foot today. Um, and most lighting is much more efficient than that. Um, the, the dramatic cost reduction of LED technology, uh, and this has really been, you know, projects that I was doing not even 10 years ago were still using fluorescent lighting because of the cost of LED. Um, LED is now um, completely standard. Uh, I have not worked on a project that hasn't used LED, and I can't even remember how long. So that uh, the, 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 the drop in cost of LED technology and solar technology um, in the last 15 years has been a huge driver um, in the reduction of lighting um, power. The other is just uh, intelligent control. So um, occupancy vacancy sensors, um, uh, not not just uh, wall mounted or ceiling mounted, but even onboard in the fixtures. You see these in garages and stairwells and things like that. That has a big impact. Um, if you think about just all the parking garages in the city of Chicago that have um, metal halides that are running 24 seven, um, those are being replaced by LEDs that are being switched. Um, so much less draw at peak um, and then um, set back most of the the hours that's a significant um, impact but we're at the point now where we've really i think squeezed all we can out of the lighting um out of lighting yeah we're to a point where uh we're actually i think over lighting in some ways um the 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 impact of of lighting is so low now that we're seeing just lighting being deployed in every nook and cranny um and i think we've kind of bottomed out in terms of of the impact we can squeeze out of out of lighting at this point yeah, I think the one one of the uh, pieces of magic about LED lighting is the the dramatic um, energy reductions um, do pay for that 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 install. And while you're there with that, well, in internal install or truck roll on a street light, um, 
very often you'll just put in an IoT sensor. And, and all, very often the largest impact is not just the safer and better quality of life lighting conditions, but the, but the idea that your street light could now backhaul, oh, your sewage lift station information or mm-hmm. anything else or, or garbage um, con, you know, container, refuse container fill level or anything. Uh, that's a little hard to monetize and um, even measure, but having a backhaul network uh, in the building that's ubiquitous is allows all that transparency to happen much quicker than it might have happened um, in other cases. Yeah, it's also just the reduction in maintenance, uh, not having to change an incandescent lamp every year, um, going to it every 10 years or every 15 plus years um, right. is, is a significant reduction in cost that um, that isn't always accounted for when we're doing these replacements and doesn't really need to be anymore because the cost has become much more on par. So let's let's move on to EV charging. And there's a whole constellation of different issues and subjects there from from simply deployment of EV charging stations to vehicle to grid applications um, to what do you do in in, multi dwelling unit buildings. Um, Can you touch on some of those? Yeah, so uh, EV charging is something that we've really seen proliferate here in the last couple of years. It's actually become part of the city of Chicago's sustainable development plan um, to have 20% of uh, parking be what they call EV ready, which is having the capacity on site and uh, the distribution logistics there. So you don't have to have the charging, the chargers, the level two chargers at the space, but you have to have the power at the site. You have to have the vertical distribution and infrastructure there so that those can be easily deployed in the future. And this is this is a significant load that people need to understand um, when you're doing a big parking structure um, that may be we're working on a project right now that has 1500 spaces or 1400 spaces. So when you're looking at 20, almost 300 EV uh, charging spots, that's a significant you know, megawatts worth of power. It's a, it's a lot of power. Um, but what it does, um, where, where it has uh, some challenges on the infrastructure side, um, you know, as a, I, I actually own an EV and what I found in the last year and a half of driving that, um, that vehicle is um, I've saved a tremendous amount of time by utilizing the convenience of number one, charging at my home and not having to go to, um, uh, to fueling stations, but also we have chargers at the the garage right across the street from our office. Um, and so just the amount of time I've saved by not having to go to fueling stations and the fact that I just don't ever worry about, you hear about range anxiety. I never worry about how much fuel I have in my car. It's almost always full. Um, and so the only time I really think about it is on, is on road trips, which, um, you know, that's a, that's a big significant challenge. Um, it's not really the urban deployment of these chargers, which in most urban areas is fairly good today. It's the rural um, interstate um, fast charging network that really is something that needs to be um, invested in. And that's what is the, the administration is doing right now through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we're seeing the, you know, the electrified Route 66 um, with the um, uh, charging networks deployed around uh, Lake Michigan here um, to serve Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Indiana, and Illinois, um, and so th- that is a big challenge um, that I think is is uh, being addressed, and it's going to take some time um, and uh, some investment in the grid. But is at the end of the day, I think once people kind of escape from the the fuel station, what I call the fuel station mentality of driving an internal combustion engine vehicle, I drive it till it's empty, then I got to go get gas. You have to think of it like it's your phone. It's something you just plug in every day. And when you wake up, it's 100%. And you're, and in the case of an EV, more like 80 or 85. Um, but uh, it's just something that's always charged and that you're charging. There's just so much time where you're not using your vehicle that you just charge it and it becomes so much more convenient than going to filling stations. Yeah, it's fascinating when you think about the cost of that asset and the utilization rate of the average personally owned vehicle is two to five percent. Yep, ninety percent. It's uh, it's idle. Yeah, it's it's idle. Over you know over time, there may be fewer vehicles simply because people recognize how costly they are for what they what they do. The other yeah, the other advantage is that you're you're just um, we've seen it in sort of the um, deployment of of. 
commercial grade security cameras where a lot of people have, you know, video doorbells and things like that. What's that, what that's done is created a huge, um, you know, ad hoc surveillance network, which has its, you know, pros and cons that I won't get into, but what the, uh, the expansion of EVs, which is, you know, now crossed 5% market share in, in Illinois, we're about to hit 60,000 registrations. Um, this creates an uh, army of, 70 to 100 kW battery packs that are out there that with the right technology could act to stabilize the grid, um, can act as energy storage um, during periods of night. So as we transition to renewable technologies, we can charge our EVs. You know, Right now, everybody charges at night during low demand. Well, in the future, ideally, we charge during the day when we've got that solar um, capacity, and then our batteries would act to stabilize the grid at night. That technology is not here yet, um, but it's it's coming. And sort of another exciting thing is just the um, the renewable part of EV batteries. Um, we're, we're really starting to get heavily invested into recycling of these batteries. Um, you know, Redwood just is just announced this week that they're opening a recycling plant in South Carolina. Um, there's other competitors that are doing that as well, where they're promising you know 90 plus percent recovery on some of the the critical minerals that you know represent long-term security and, and economic uh, risks to, to the United States. Um, being able to recover those minerals provides not only that, increases not only that security, but also drastically drops the cost of those, those battery packs. Um, and then in turn will drastically drop the cost of those vehicles and make them easily more um, easy to, uh, to deploy in, in large numbers that we need here in the future. Well, and, well Andrew, this, we've covered an awful lot of ground today. Uh, very, so, so thank you. Uh, what let's just shift to so what are the implement implications for for the industry as we move forward in this ecosystem? Um, you know what what do you see for the future? Uh, what recommendations can you make? Yeah, I think what you what I, the recommend the big recommendation that I would make is for anyone that's that's planning a new asset. So somebody that's in the process of planning a even a 15 year lease, um, but especially if you're looking at um, a 50 to 100 year um, new asset, you need to really be intelligently considering how are you gonna make that 100% electric? It doesn't need to be done today, but it will need to be done within the next 15 to 20 years. Um, and so pushing that off for 15 years to figure out is not a recipe for success. If you're planning for a long-term asset, you need to be able to show that um, you can do that relatively quickly and, and um, logistically simply in the future. And a lot of that is developing these bridge solutions that we have. It's not just important for the financial viability of your asset um, directly, but also indirectly, because the tenants that are going to be looking to lease space from you are going to want to understand what is your plan to do this? If you don't do it on day one, what is your plan to do it in 10 years or 15 years? I need to be able to show this to my employees that we're occupying an asset that has this flexibility. Um, and you may be asked to do it to accommodate an anchor tenant. It may be something that becomes non-negotiable. So having that planning in place is incredibly critical um, um, for uh, an asset that, that has a long time frame, uh, a long time, long time horizon. That's great. Um, we're nearing the end of our time, Andrew, today. So are there um, any additional comments you'd like to make for our, to, to our listeners? Uh, yeah, I guess the only thing I'd say is that, um, you know, I, I kind of mentioned earlier that you know, the first, uh, the last half of the 20th century was a, a fairly um, low period of movement for my industry. And it's really drastically accelerated through the first quarter of this century. Um, you know, we're really on the cusp of a lot of exciting things. It's not just electrification, but it's also the return to office environment. The fact that, you know, what we experience in the workplace, what we expect out of the workplace um, has drastically changed in the last three years. And a lot of that is, is very um, dynamic moving forward. And so there's a tremendous amount of opportunities with, with that, um, you know, with that dynamic condition and the fact that we have these intelligent building technologies that allow us to measure and adapt to that. And it's just really critical that, um, and our clients do understand this, that you're planning for that and that you're, um, you're understanding that this is not just a challenge, but it's an incredible opportunity. Great. Um, for, for our listeners, um, can you share your contact information in case they would like to uh, reach out to ESD or yourself? Absolutely. So you can find me on, on LinkedIn. Um, 
Andrew Lehrer, L-E-H-R-E-R. Um, you can find me and also through our company's website, esdglobal.com. Hmm. Very good. Well, th thank you uh, again, Andrew. Um, just summing up uh, today, we've been speaking with Andrew Lehrer, practice leader of high performance building practice at ESD in, in Chicago. Uh, I'm Jim Frazier, Vice President of Smart Cities here at ARC, and I was happy also uh, in the background to be joined by Gavin Simon, our producer for today. So uh, again, thank you, Andrew. Thank you to the team at ESD, and we look forward to seeing all of our listeners again on the next edition of a Smart City podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's ours. Pleasure's ours. Thanks. Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities.